Welcome everyone to our 15th Brown Bag Lunch presentation. And uh, thank you for coming. A webcast is gonna begin here in about a minute and a half. And so I'd like to bring uh, Mary Lou Verder Carlos, our assistant director, up to uh, introduce our speakers today. So Mary Lou and Martha and Nayamin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Department of Pesticide Regulations Brown Bag Lunch Presentation, Environmental Justice and Pesticides. Just for uh, logistics, the emergency exit is directly out these two doors, and the restrooms are on the opposite end of the second floor, for those of you that haven't been to this building. Anyway, thank you for coming out for this special presentation in behalf of our Deputy Director, Chief Deputy Director Teresa Marks, um, I am Mary Lou Verder Carlos, Assistant Director for the Department. We are very excited to hear from our scientists on how schools have been using integrated pest management or IPM and about recent updates to the Healthy Schools Act. Environmental justice is something our department takes very seriously across the board. We conduct extensive outreach on pesticide safety and awareness to local communities, farm worker groups, promotores, and to agricultural producers as well. We are excited to have Naimin Martinez, director of the Central California Environmental Justice Network, travel all the way from Fresno to give us an update on the progress they are making in the Central Valley. Thank you, Naimin. And joining her is Martha Sanchez, our environmental justice liaison. Martha has taken pesticide safety outreach, bilingual outreach to a new level. She is conducting DPR's fifth EJ, or Environmental Justice Workshop, in Riverside in November, and will tell us a little bit about DPR's outreach efforts as well. Please join me in welcoming Nayamin Martinez and Martha Sanchez. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here on behalf of the Central California Environmental Justice Network. I know it's a super long name, so from now on, I'm just going to refer to it as CCJN. That's the term most of you that already are familiar with the organization. That's how you know us. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Nayamin. I came on board with CCJN two and a half years ago. However, the Central Valley of California, Fresno in particular, has been my home in the last 18 years. That's where I moved when I uh, migrated from Mexico to California. And um, I, it has been a wonderful experience uh, meeting a lot of people. Some of them I already uh, met, you know, I haven't seen them for maybe over a decade and are here today. So it feels like I am in a family right now and I'm very, very happy to be here. So I hope that my remarks are gonna really um, help you understand a little bit more about the environmental justice issues that we have in the Central Valley and the work that my organization, but many more organizations are doing and how we are partnering with regulatory agencies, not only DPR, but as you would see, even US EPA, which was the entity that funded one of the projects that I'm gonna be uh, describing in my presentation. So without further ado, I will start by just explaining a little bit about CCJN. Who has ever heard or work or know anything about this organization before today? Oh, quite a, quite a few. Okay, well, I'm glad. That means we are tiny, but we're, we're no, not there. So, well, CCJN has been in existence since the early 2000s. And really, the, what prompted the formation of this organization was that a lot of activists and leaders in the San Joaquin Valley were noticing that air pollution, water contamination, pesticide exposure was not affecting everyone equally. Unfortunately, it was affecting more low-income communities of color. So that's why they formed the organization with the spirit of really trying to fight um, sorry, environmental injustice and environmental racism. So what we have done since then is really trying to minimize the exposure that these communities, these low-income communities are having to pesticides, to emissions coming out from uh, diesel trucks or wells or whatever the, the reality of these neighborhoods are. So that's the work that we have been doing in the last 18 years. And um, I just want to say, uh, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have been at least driving through the San Joaquin Valley. But I think that it would, it would be important to just take a look at the San Joaquin Valley. I'm sure you have seen Calenvira screen. But even before Calenvira screen, that now is a very uh, important and useful tool for us to graphically show 
what is the reality that we we have in, in the San Joaquin Valley with where most of our communities score really high in calamvirus screen. That's why we have the orange and the red in the central part of the state. But even before then, we have been partnering with researchers like Jonathan London from UC Davis, and they have already uh, helped us document our exposure to pesticides, to um, other, many more other toxic contaminants. Um, so uh, we're well known to be the basket of the world. We grow most of the uh, produce that are consumed not only here in California, but around the world. But uh, along to that uh, produ uh, production, it's also our um, our exposure to pesticides, to fertilizers, to water contamination, and to many other things that are uh, a byproduct of all these activities. So what we have we done to, to try to minimize that? First and foremost, we have educated residents in the San Joaquin Valley. A lot of them, like myself, were immigrants. And we come from a country where, you know, we take as a given where we are living. We don't question that we have you know, a diesel truck running by our neighborhood. We don't question that there's pesticide application. We don't question that there's a water well 50 feet away from where we live. We're like, you know, aquí nos tocó vivir. It's like, bad luck, we have to live here. So we start educating our residents that that's not okay. That there's a concept called environmental justice, that they need to have uh, access to a clean environment, regardless of your race, your socioeconomic status. So that's an important thing that we do. We have developed materials. We have developed a 101 EJ curriculum for adults. We recently partnered with a consultant in developing a curriculum that is aligned. Uh, it's a curriculum that is going to be for sixth graders to 12th uh, grade, and it's aligned to the STEM curriculum. So it's really trying to connect uh, middle school and high school students to their reality. So they learn hands-on science, but they learn it also connected to the problems that their communities are facing. So we are so eager in a couple of months, we're gonna be launching this curriculum and we're very excited about that. So that's just one example of how we educate community members. Uh, but not only that, we also advocate for changes. Oftentimes through all these pro uh, education efforts, we notice that there are, there's need for changes in the regulations, in the laws, in the systems that are really uh, there to protect the environments of these communities. So we also do advocacy work. And we network with a lot of other organizations and with regulatory agencies because we know that these problems are so big that it would be impossible for us to solve them alone. One important program that we have been implementing in the, since 2011 is the IVAN reporting network or identifying violations of faith affecting neighborhoods. I'm sure that a, a lot of you have already heard of it. Can you raise your hand if you have not heard of IVAN? Oh, so still a handful that haven't heard of it. So it's not a name. I know Ivan is a first name, but in this case is the acronym of this wonderful program that was the, the brainchild of this guy who is there at, in the photo. His name is Luis Olmedo. He's a very, very uh, you know, active leader in the Imperial Valley. So he came up with this idea that we need tools to empower residents to actually report the environmental problems in their communities. They are the experts in, of what is affecting their neighborhoods, but they don't know who is responsible to fix what. They don't know who's in charge of water. They don't know who's in charge of toxic waste. They don't know who's in charge of the different um, uh, pollutants that are affecting their neighborhoods. So that's the spirit of IBAN, really giving their, the uh, residents the tools to report the problems and then bringing all regulatory agencies to the table at, from the local to the state level to try to address these problems. And um, right now there's uh, seven, soon to be eight communities that have the, the luxury of having an IVAN in their, in their uh, area. So my organization is only responsible for administrating IVAN in Fresno and Kern, but there are other EJ organizations that are doing the same in other parts of the state, like uh, Green Action is responsible for the one in Bayview Hunters Point. There's also an IBAN, of course, in uh, Imperial Valley and Coachella, which is run by Comité Civico del Valle. There's an IBAN in Wilmington. Um, and then soon, thanks to the generosity of the Cal EPA and through their small EJ grants, we're going to be able to expand IBAN to Tulare County in the beginning of next year. So we're already working on that, and we're very, very excited about it. So a little bit more about IBAN. 
Um, Ivan is, as I said, a way to make easy for community members to report problems. So how do we do it easy? So we created a platform, an online platform, where people can go and submit their reports, but they can also do it through a phone call or through sending a text message. And just uh, uh, about two months ago, we launched the um, up phone app version of Ivan. In, that's, right now, it's only in Kern County, but um, we believe that's going to be really uh, groundbreaking for to allow, especially farm workers. When they are in the field, it's hard for them to, you know, uh, submit a report. They they were submitting it via phone uh, phone messages or test messages, but they could not submit photos. And with the phone app, they will be able to do so. So that's going to be a, an important step forward. Okay, so. What can you submit? Uh, what kind of reports? I mean, this is just a list of some of the reports that we normally get. And this is just when we try to talk to people about the problems that they can report, if you just say environmental problems, they're going to go like, what is that? So we try to break it down. So, you know, is someone dumping illegally in your community? Is someone burning trash? Is Have you noticed something, you know, in your water? Uh, so you need to break it down because environmental, uh, uh, just environmental uh, is a term that might not be too easy to uh, understand for especially low uh, educated residents. So you need to give examples and prompt some of those. However, the list of the problems that we have received is so long from, you know, aggressive uh, dogs to you name it. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of the times they're not like totally environmentally re related, but we don't really say oh, I cannot handle this report. We try to help them take that report to whatever it's, it's uh, they're gonna find a solution for it. Okay, so what happened? When the, so the report is submitted, we, we take it upon ourselves to understand which are the different entities that need to address that report. Oftentimes it's more than one. And uh, in a variety of, of circumstances, I have to call people and ask them because it's it's kind of like, oh my God, where, where do I go from here? For instance, once we had a report about um, illegal uh, body shop in an orchard near Fresno. So, oh my God, do you guys know who regulates body shops? Well, guess what? There's a lot of entities, environmental health, the air district, and at least four of them were involved in this case. So, and I had no clue when I received it. So I've been learning so much through this program. So really, Ivan, what it does, it really brings, as I said, together uh, regulatory agencies and community members and EJ organizations. And we do so because we meet monthly. We, we have a task force at every community where we have an Ivan. And uh, that way, we also make sure that these reports are really follow through and that there's an accountability process on the other end so that we can come back and tell the reporter, this is where your problem is. A lot of the times the reports are open for years because these are not easy issues. We have from contamination of water in a, a rural community that, you know, in order to get funding for a new well, it takes more than a couple of months. It literally takes three or four years. Or there's very easy to solve problems like only a illegal dumping problem that they go and they clean it and it's fixed. So, um, Basically, for us, we, we see ourselves as a bridge between the community mem members and the regulatory agencies. And what we have seen as a positive impact of IBAN is really uh, increasing, for one, the awareness about environmental problems, uh, the interest of community members to be more proactive in, in, in making sure their environment is clean and safe, and also the responsiveness and accountability of the re regulatory agencies. So that's a big part. And also uh, having a, a better relationship with a lot of these entities. Uh, for instance, in our case, it had been really important, our partnership with DPR, because it has helped us improve our relationship with the county out commissioners, uh, that sometimes the relationships tend to be a little bit tense uh, because you know, we are here representing farm workers that are being sprayed with pesticides, and oftentimes they are, you know, up, kind of siding on the on the growers' uh, part. So, it it has helped pretty much. And uh, pesticides are, of course, as you would not be surprised, a lot of the uh, reports that we get because of the agricultural activity in our area. And this is just an example of how really we see Ivan being effective. So. Um, Kern County, for the most part, is a very um, approachable uh, commissioner. However, the, the, the
the way they handle uh, reports, especially when they, they involve a lot of uh, a affected uh, residents have improved a lot. So this particular case was in 2017. So there was a, uh, there were two incidents, one in May and one in August. All combined, there were over 100 uh, farm workers who were affected by uh, several applications. And instead of taking them more than a year or close to two years to uh, complete this application, it was done in less than six months. And there were like uh, thousands of uh, dollars of fines that were um, imposed to the violators. So I don't think that without uh, the, the accountability process that Ivan brings to the table, this would have been possible. And I'm just gonna um, give a next specific example of how Ivan has also been a, been a platform to straighten the relationship with DPR and the Act Commissioners. So thanks to a grant that we received from US EPA through their EJ small grants, we were able to um, uh, do like a citizen science project where we form a, a, a cohort of uh, EJ leaders from Fresno, Kern, and Tulare counties. And these leaders were trained in some of the um, safety, uh, pesticide safety um, regulations that are normally offered to the, the inspectors that work for DPR. And we did that by starting the first, the very first uh, iteration of the environmental justice uh, workshop that DPR uh, had done. And uh, we did in partnership with, uh, at that time, Paul Berkey, Berkey was working with us. We did it in Fresno County. Um, so it was, this is the photo where we were at the Fresno County Act Commissioner's Office. It was the very first time that he actually hosted community environmental uh, justice advocates in his office and talked to us and actually meet with us. And we were like having a dialogue like partners. So that was a very big uh, accomplishment for us. And um, not only we have that, but we had people, uh, representatives from all the levels. This is a representative from U US EPA talking about FIFRA and what is their role in implementing pesticide regulations. Of course, we have the DPR and the, uh, and the Act Commissioner explaining about their role in um, enforcement of pesticide regulations. We also had a, a tour at a farm where they did a mock application and you know the important thing is that all this information that the cohort participants who are residents just like me what they gain through this is that they share them with their community members so now community members are more informed of what are the regulations that are out there to protect them they have been spreading the word out by creating um, community meetings where they have been sharing this information with the other residents uh, that was the photo where the uh, participants received a certificate signed by the DPR director, Brian Leahy. So, you know, that's a sense of empowerment. You know, if you're a resident, when would you imagine even getting a certificate signed by the DPR director? And in one of these uh, workshops, um, Brian Leahy was there, the one that we did in, in Santa Maria, because at least ECJN partnered with DPR for three of these workshops, Fresno, Bakersfield, and Santa Maria. Um, this is uh, the picture of the participants receiving their certificate in, in Bakersfield in their workshop. So um, I think I've already taken more than the time that they gave me, so I'm on okay in time. Okay. <laughs> I tend to talk a lot, sorry. So for me, I think that what inspired me to, to work in CCJN, and even before my time in CCJN, I have always worked for nonprofit organizations is that I have a, a conviction of, of helping and sharing and making, trying to make people's life better. Before I was working on access to healthcare services, but also through that I work a lot with farm workers and I noticed how much you know they were exposed to a lot of things, not only pesticides, but many other things, and that they have very limited access to healthcare services. So to me, it was about helping others, and I'm really happy that the, the role that I'm playing right now within CCJN allows me to do that. I, I totally embrace the, the vision of the organization uh, and uh, that, you know, we, we could be a partner helping to reach out to farm workers and, and teaching uh, and empowering residents that need to, to learn about regulations. Um, so I will stop there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. That was wonderful, Nayamin. And of course, it shows us that the need is there. 
but we need to have people like in Ayamin and other uh, staff in the right department, in the right um, advocacy groups to actually make things happen. But it takes a collaboration, like she says. So now I'm going to start with my uh, presentation, which is, includes uh, outreach and environmental justice. So Marta Elena Sanchez, <laughs> like Paul Berkey said. So um, the state law required DPR to have an outreach person, an outreach program uh, within the department, and of course to educate farm workers and the community in general when they use or, or, or they're being affected by pesticides. So that uh, included r the rural and non-rural areas. So in 2007, I was hired by the worker, protect, uh, worker health and safety branch to do outreach to the community. And it was obvious, you know, I, I'm from Mexico, so I, I speak both languages and I knew the, I know the community and, but in the beginning it was a challenge for me because there was nothing. There was no, no manual, there was no workbook, nothing. So I knew that I had the heart to go out and talk to the community, but it was a challenge, but I welcomed it because I knew that, um, you know, I had DPR's backup on, on coming out and reaching out to the community. So this is a, a 2008 uh, environmental justice strategic plan. Um, and as you can see there, uh, we're also ensuring uh, environmental justice as part of my new role. So the outreach approach, um, mainly I knew that I had to partner with all the ag commissioners, which is 58 counties and 55 current ag commissioners. So that was also to distribute pesticide safety information anywhere, just about anywhere. Health fairs, uh, community meetings, like for example, this Sunday I was at El Grito, the Mexican Independence Day in Salinas, where 50,000 people showed up. So that's a big, big event. Um, also, I had to develop trust within the community and the organizations that I was dealing with. Uh, not only because I spoke the language and I look Mexican, I was welcome. You, you know, you have to have a, I, I embrace the community and I sure let them know that I was there to help them, to answer any questions. And uh, basically, because all this is from my background, I was taught, you know, how to talk to them with respect, how sometimes just listen. Because a lot of these people not only have pesticide issues, they have other problems going on out there. And I'm going to have a list at the end of what type of issues uh, they deal with in, in a daily basis. So of course I spoke uh, Spanish. Um, so I knew also that we had to come up with outreach materials because I was the eyes and ears for DPR and I, I was listening to see what was the need for us to do, not only where to be, but also um, you know, come up with outreach materials. So uh, outreach and education. Um, partner with Promotoras de Salud. I hope you all know by now what Promotoras de Salud are because they're the leaders in the community. They're the to-go person. Uh, to -go person. Um, Saturday, I was at Vision y Compromisos, another regional um, Promotora conference in Berkeley. So we like to partner with Vision y Compromiso because they're the network in California of uh, over, you know, like in, in next month, they're gonna have their Promotora conference where over a thousand promotoras show up. So they're the community leaders and definitely we need to let them know who we are, what type of services we provide, and that we've been invited by them to come and give them presentations and, and even share our outreach materials with them so they can distribute it within the community. Also, like I mentioned, direct participation in health fairs, public events, uh, and broadcast in Spanish, uh, uh, in indigenous languages. Uh, we worked a lot with uh, Radio Bilingue, uh, in Fresno, in Salinas, um, in, in San Francisco, we, we've been just about everywhere. Um, also Univision in Santa Rosa was inviting us twice a year to come and interview us. And we've done also uh, impromptu uh, interviews. Like I could be in a, my information booth and they would show up and start asking me questions and boom, you know, and that's one way of also reaching to the community. Uh, we've done, DPR has done a lot of uh, focus groups so the way we know the community wants to learn is by visuals. Uh, they listen a lot to the radio when they're working or even heading to work. I do too. <laughs> so um, one way is television, radio, and newspapers. So um, the way to build relationships, um, I had to, you know, I have to work with the county agricultural commissioners 
but by by now I already know exactly who the person to talk to. Um, these are collaborations also with US EPA. This is just a short list of the organizations that I work hand in hand. And ALRB is, is here, and I also commend them because they just hired um, Santiago, their new Mesteco worker. Stand up, Santiago. Yeah. He's their new outreach worker who, who speaks three, three languages, Spanish, English, and, and Misteco. And then also we have Calagrability from UC Davis too. Uh, too. We, we, like I said, we work hand in hand. We communicate each other. We let each other know where the health fairs are going to be. And um, it, this is a, a very short list, but it could go on and on. <laughs> so now with my environmental justice uh, role, I, ha I also, you know, partner with the community, uh, with the Ag Commissioners. And basically I've been invited at two of their meetings. And uh, I explained to me to them, especially you know, what's my new role and what's EJ. Uh, there's a lot of advocacy groups out there, uh, you know, protecting uh, either you know the children in the schools or just the community in general. So I love my new role because I am part of the community, and I, all these years that I've been doing outreach, I've heard the concerns from the community. But I also been in DPR for 29 years. So I know the science, I know the data, I know the regulations, you know, how things trickle down from, Kelly, uh, from US EPA to DPR and the Act Commissioners. So I'm in a perfect position because I can help each other. You know, I can help my department and I also can help the community and the advocacy groups in getting things done. And the eyes and ears um, also, uh, I also part of, I am part of the executive team, so I come to the table and let uh, the director, the, the chief director, know what's what's the uh, concerns from the community, what the um, and Kevin, this is perfect because you always say I know everybody in California, and you're not wrong there because uh, I when I took my new role, I already was working with this organization, so it was perfect, and I'm not kidding you. The first time I met with one of the groups. Next thing, they call me up and they're like, oh, Martha, I'm sorry I had to be rude like that, but that's my role. And I'm like, don't worry, you do your job and I'll do mine and we'll get things done, right? So um, these are some of the groups that I've been working with. And lately, Save Act, Safe Schools um, in Monterey, they've been very advocates uh, for the, with the protections for the children and the staff at the schools. So we so far have been having uh, really better com communication, collaboration. I'm connecting the, the Act Commissioner and this group. So now we are at the table and we're talking. Uh, special projects that I've done in the 10 years that I've been doing outreach, um, field worker trainings, the Act Commissioners will, will invite me and say, you know, can you help us do a, a presentation for the field workers and train them? Sure enough, and I'm there. And these are some of the counties that they do uh, free field worker trainings. Topics like worker protection standards, you know, what to do in case they get drifted, who to contact, um, you know, how not to take pesticides home or residues, protecting the family. Also, we've done breaking barriers along with US EPA, Fabiola Estrada and myself, we, in enforcement, we, uh, we have one coming up in the 26th of this month in Santa Barbara. But what that consists is we go and train the inspectors from the surrounding counties on how to talk to the field workers, how to break that barrier. You know, don't just show up and show your badge or you tell them you're with the act commissioner, but instead, you know, be more human. Buenos dias, oh, this is a beautiful weather today. You know, things like that. So you don't come up, you know, uh, in, a, in a negative way and they, you know, they'll just put their shield and they're like, oh no, the mayordomo is over there. Don't, you don't need to talk to me. But no, so we're, we're teaching them also Spanish words on how to approach uh, field workers and, you know, the norms. And believe me, after the, they leave, they're like so happy that they took this class because it's going to help them in, in, in their careers and also for us to get a better report of the incidents that are happening out there. Uh, promotores training, we've done with poison control systems and also the Office of Binational Border Health all throughout the state. They, we've done... Uh, and especially with uh, ALRB also, we've invited them as special guests to come and present for the, for the promotores. Uh, we, we did a soil fumigant, it was a special project uh, with US EPA. We did the uh, soil fumigant training um, in Monterey County and let them know, what, you know what, how soil fumigants can affect their neighborhoods. 
So that even like, like Naomi said, it empowers them even not to just to know, to be educated. Uh, we, I've done, s continue doing Spanish interpretation, translation on outreach materials and developing these outreach materials. Uh, we did one for maintenance gardeners, you know, because they showed up to my table and what do you do? Well, I'm a maintenance gardener. Well, you know, guess what? Are you using herb herbicides? Yes, I do. They didn't know that they had to have a license to, in order to apply them. Uh, but mostly, you know, we, we develop this information also so they can uh, register local with their, within the county. And a lot of the times they don't know, you know, they're clueless. So um, I also have done a lot of presentations for farm labor contractors, supervisors, handlers, growers, uh, especially when they have CE credits. <laughs> I just got invited by the Santa Cruz uh, Act Commissioner. They're going to have a um, continuing education credits in, in their in their um, com in their office. So they invited me to come and present about EJ, which is a great opportunity. But these are a list of some of the organizations that I work with. And um, Emily and I, we went to meet Driscoll, and that was also like a, a breaker that we were there. It's like people say, "How did you get there?" We you know we try reaching out to them. So congratulations, Emily. <laughs> you made it happen. Um, but this is a list of, uh, since I started the outreach, I've been doing an Excel spreadsheet of the events that I've been going to and also the counties that I've been and within that county, which cities and when and how many times. So this is, has worked really well, great because it shows me where I need to be. Okay, This is where I've been, but where else... I have not been. So I'm like the enterprise. I want to go where no one has gone before. So <laughs> Martha needs to get there. <laughs> so the feedback, of course, is very positive because, you know, now they, they know. In the beginning, they didn't know who DPR was, who the Act Commissioner is. We're collaborating more with the Act Commissioners. They see a face. When they, think, when they hear DPR, they think Martha Sanchez and even Brian Lee, he said, Martha, well, I went down to Monterey and they practically could say that you, you live down there. Yeah, it's true. I was just down there Sunday. <laughs> so it's very positive from service agencies because every year they keep inviting me they, they, or they refer me to somebody else who's going to have an, an, an event. And some problems, of course, it still exist. And that's that not everybody still knows about the Act Commissioners or DPR. Um, also, that see, uh, the Agricultural Commissioners, they need more bilingual staff. Some of them do have bilingual staff, but they need... They need more, you know, they need to, somebody to feel comfortable in calling them in Spanish. And unfortunately, they still don't trust governmental officials. But that's okay, we're working, we're working on that. And um, we created a lot of outreach materials, and some of, them, some of you already got some of, of the brochures on the front. But this is a whole list, and of course, they're in, in bilingual. And this is what's coming. We're doing um, outreach videos in Hmong. We contracted with uh, Fresno University, and uh, we're going to have a mobile complaint app coming up as well. Uh, we're working, we just finished our, our environmental justice workshop in San Joaquin, and we're working on the one in Riverside. And the pesticide safety information series is also coming up, the updated one, and compliance assistant updates, and social media and website posts. So... We have done a lot, but of course there's more. And like I told you in the beginning of my presentations, these are some of the concerns uh, talking to the field workers out there. And first of all, it's retaliation. It's one of the big, big issues. That's the reason they don't want to complain. They don't, they're afraid. And, you know, it's understandable. They don't want to lose their job. They have family, you know, to feed. So... Uh, retaliation is number one. So, you know, here I come and tell them, you know, the law says do this, do that. But in reality, they say, if I go back and tell that to my supervisor, I'll get fired or, or I'll get cut from hours. So some of them are not taken for medical care. They're, you know, they're just like, oh, go home. You know, if you, if you got drifted on pesticides, go home, take a shower and come back. And uh, everywhere, there are different, um, different examples. Like I was in Imperial Valley and one of the field workers said, Oh no, the, the mayordomo took me like right next to the border and gave me thirty dollars. Here you, you seek medical care in Mexicali. So things like that. Um, there or also, you know, is their own fault. They don't want to be taken for medical care because again, they think, you know, they I gotta work. I can't get sick. I, I you know, I gotta feed my family. And a lot of the times they say, Oh, you know, the 
the clinic is already with a grower, so nothing is going to happen. They're just, you know, they're just going to send me home, and I need to work. Also, some of them have not received training. You know, by law, they have to be uh, trained on pesticide safety, and a lot of them have not received it, and also they have not received it in their language. I mean, we have a big community, uh, indigenous community in Ventura, Fresno, Santa Rosa, where they say, you know, we go and it's in Spanish, and we, you know, we don't understand what they're saying. So that's not right. That's, that's, that's against the law. You know, they have to be trained on, on the language they understand. And of course, like I said, with the focus groups, more pictures and less wordings. Um, also, they've been mistreated. You know, they're called so many things, and they're just mistreated, unfortunately. And also pesticides is, is still a, a problem out there. You know, they, a lot of them don't, don't, don't know, you know, if, if, if an odor, if they got exposed by odor, you know, or they got a rash, they don't know if they, that has to be do with pesticides. So there's a lot more that we need to do. Sexual harassment continues, but not only for females, but males as well, I've been hearing, and wages. So, Alex, please stand. We have the new outreach coordinator, Alex Cadenas. He got hired in August as, uh, in the Worker Health and Safety Branch because guess what? I got promoted. <laughs> Woohoo, like it says there. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, 10 years later, you know, I got promoted as, as DPR's Environmental Justice Liaison. And like I said, I, you know, I embrace this and look forward in, in doing something very positive not only for DPR, but for the community and the advocacy groups. So DPR's EJ activities, um, of course, collaboration again with the Act Commissioners, uh, integrate EJ into DPR's decision-making and programs, uh, meet with Cal EPA e EJ uh, programs, all, all the BDOs, some of you are here, thank you, and also collaborate with EJ community leaders, you know, call each other on the phone and, you know, and they invite me to their meetings and, you know, for sure I'll be there. Um, attend and participate monthly event network meetings. Sometimes I can't personally, because like Miami showed, they're, they're all over the state, but I can call it in and at least find out what's going on. But every time I've called, I've called in, I notice that the, someone from the Act Commissioner is there, is present, so I'm glad about that. Also participate in community meetings, you know, so I'm still, I'm still uh, meeting with the, with the community to keep hearing what are the needs and what's happening out there. And also, um, of course, interact with um, DPR's program because I'm out here, uh, sit, you know, standing in front of you, but it's just not me. I mean, all the, the, the departments, uh, the branches, they're all assisting me in one way or another. And, you know, I can't do it by myself. I can't do it without somebody's backup. <laughs> So strategic plan objectives, here's a list of the objectives that, that we, we've come up and we're going to make sure we, we make them. And I'm even hoping to increase these because, you know, I'm learning this job, but I, I know I'm going to make it even better and, and look forward in making uh, more objectives. Uh, like Nayamin mentioned, um, we had environmental pesticide workshops and we did three with, with her. Um, then the other two, we just finished one in San Joaquin when we did it in collaboration with Lideres Campesinas. So, and we have one next in Riverside in November. So that's coming up. And this is the flyer, November 5th and 6th. And we're, I'm already working with Ruben in Riverside County, the Act Commissioner, on getting, getting people registered and sign up. So the whole purpose of the uh, environmental justice is to strengthen par partnerships with community leaders or advocacy groups uh, by providing attendees a working knowledge of pesticides, you know, the enforcement side. Uh, like it, it's a two-day workshop. The first day is DPR's programs. So we have experts from each branch coming and present. And the second day we give the county agricultural commissioner an opportunity also to explain um, their role in the county and also their programs. And a lot of the times um, they get surprised that the Act Commissioners, for example, uh, they're in charge of the weights and measures. So when you go out to the gas pumps, you know, they make sure that you're paying your, your dollar's worth, you know, whatever it says on the gas pump, that's what, that's what you get. And same thing in the grocery stores, the same thing in the, in the farmer's markets. And a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know that we had an agency like that. Well, we do. So also, I'm working with uh, Cal EPA Environmental Justice Program. Um, 
actually the, the initiatives. And Kevin Ope is here from Cal EPA. And since 2014, uh, and they, you know, they've been working with, with all the BDOs, with the uh, building, uh, boards, departments, and offices. And they have conducted several initiatives. I wasn't part of it until the Pomona, but they have conducted them in Fresno, in Oakland, in LA. And of course, again, it's the goal to increase compliance with environmental laws. Um, and also, um, mainly, you know, communicate with communities and see what are the needs. As you saw in the first video when you first walked in, you know, the community, uh, it's the voice. So us as representatives, state representatives, we come in and we listen to their concerns and then we do something about it. We, you know, we, we find out where the, the order is coming from and if there's violations, believe me, they're gonna get a, a, a fine. So the community feels um, empowered because the agencies came in and, and we kind of like, you know, cleaned it up and at least they know us by, also by face and phone numbers. We provide them with a, a report back and this is what you can see here. We did this uh, report back meeting to the community. We tell them, you know, we inspected like, for example, 15 sites and we found uh, three, four violations on this. And the mapping, it, it also showed exactly where these locations were. So me coming out of the community, I would like to know where this is, where they're taking place as well. And of course, they've been well received. Uh, we're finishing right now with Imperial and we're now starting uh, in Stockton. So, um, Environmental justice list server, we try to keep updating this. It's very hard, but <laughs> now we have right now, um, we're promoting our next environmental justice workshop in Riverside. But please log on and, and, and be part of our list server so we can keep you informed what, you know, what DPR is doing in, in environmental justice. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Follow us on Facebook, link link in YouTube and <laughs> social media. Thank you very much. Thank you.